वेलकम टू दिस ट्यूटोरियल ऑन नॉलेज इन विजडम आउट आई होप बाय नाउ यू आर एबल टू सी द मेन स्लाइड या दिस आर द फोक्स हु हैव प्रिपेयर दिस ट्यूटोरियल and we have three parts i'll talk about data alone is not enough um particularly um and the duality of knowledge and data why both of them are necessary kaushik will talk about responsible data uh, data enrichment and data transfer through knowledge and usha will talk about epidemiology theory in understanding drug abuse on social media as a specific use case there was a paper uh, this is a widely um, read and cited work by pedro domingos and i like this um, you know title of a subsection section section 4 he said data alone is not enough uh, he put it very succinctly although the idea has been around um if you look at um the uh, evolution of ai um and we, we saw the um use of symbolic ai in the first wave of ai and we are, we are now you know what is seen as towards the end of the second uh, wave of ai uh, that of statistical ai and as we have um moved uh, from the um left to the right um the ability to interpret how the system works how it comes to conclusion explain how it comes to conclusion has gone down the system has become more and more powerful in terms of how data is exploited how particularly big data is exploited in all the different ways statistics statistics are put to use but um, you may notice that deeper you go with the deep learning the darker it gets uh, and it, it, here the word darker is um, Uh, in not just in how we represent it here but in terms of uh, how uh, little visibility we have in terms of how the computation works now when you look at um, some of the most successful um efforts in ai um they they are very good at taking very large space of possibilities also very large amount of data is available and um much of the processing uh, and the system is very good at processing at a lower level of uh, representation something that is closer to what we have in the raw data and when you are doing something like a search uh, the system has shown amazing capability of finding and looking at all the options and deciding what um Uh, uh you know what what choices to make however there are a whole number of limitations that you will um see with regards to uh these set of techniques in this statistical learning tech technique if you ask who was the 44th president of the united states of america um while you may have extremely uh, you know powerful model with many many parameters and the one that has consumed very large amount of data there still um uh, you know limitation in that it says oh it's barack obama with certain percentage um likelihood and still there's another option like donald trump how does this even think that donald trump could be 44th president and clearly so the um this is not very um uh reasonable uh in the way you know compared to how a human would think there would be hardly any um uh, uncertainty if uh, faced with this question and the data you have on the wikipedia on the left side it just says barack obama 44 president something is very clearly available and such data is already consumed by such language model there are many um uh examples um where um 
the uh, deep learning methods um, you see here, uh, BERT and Roberta, um, have not performed very well. Um, in the, um, you know, while the task may be sentiment analysis, something that has been studied for uh, quite some time, uh, with certain uh, situations like these modifiers that you see, the system fails remarkably. Uh, there are a few recent examples for Roberta, but otherwise you see all those picture, you know, figures in red, and it is very hard to see why the system would be performing so badly. One interesting observation is that that I will have to make is that at the, given all this data, the specific problem that is solved by these uh, AI algorithms has been relatively simple. They would do a classification, they would do ranking and recommendation, they would do prediction. But the humans uh, make decisions, when the humans make decisions, there is a lot more complexity and you know it cannot be made purely based on data. So um, um, that's something I would like to explain. Um, you look at this pyramid, um, there is 150, this is what the data is. Uh, this is what comes from a sensor, like blood pressure sensor. And then you have information, label data, systolic blood pressure of 150 mmHg. Mmh. After that, you use a knowledge such as how, what defines, uh, what, what, what is a reasonable blood pressure for a for a human being uh, with certain demographics. Uh, and um, you would, uh, based on the NHLDI, uh, National Institute of Health's uh, recommendation, anything above 130 mmHg for systolic blood pressure is elevated blood pressure. Even this kind of classification may be done by uh, you know, AI system, but uh, ultimately a human has to make much more complex uh, complex decision, the clinician, the doctor, uh, you know, before he can act upon this data and this information, and even the knowledge, there is a further um, choice to be made, whether it is hyperthyroidism and hypertension, which both of them can lead to elevated blood pressure. But beyond that, there's a lot more that goes into before you can come up with a uh, healthcare, you know, health management plan with a medication, for that patient. There is patient's specific situation, there is patient's own desire whether to take medication or not, uh, uh, whether uh, there is doctor's own uh, preferences, uh, there, are, there are patient's own unique circumstances, for example, uh, 150 pay, you know, MMHG, uh, that is a high blood pressure uh, for a 40 year old. But if somebody is 80 year old with heart trouble, then that is not something you would want to manage. It's very contextual in nature. And there is a lot more information that goes in before you can come up with a uh, 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 you know, decision uh, you know, on how to act before you can decide how to act for this particular situation. So you need explainability, personalization, you have to worry about user safety and so on and so forth. And this whole, um, you know, um, uh, so, so what I want, so this whole tutorial is about uh, convincing you that you, you need to have both data and knowledge to get the wisdom such that you can have deeper insight, better decision and timely actions. That just the simplistic AI techniques that we have doesn't cut it. So what is wisdom? On the left hand side, you will see a dictionary definition. Uh, it's um, uh, making good judgment. And um, uh, it manifests through deep insight, better decision action, and makes data actionable. Knowledge plays a critical role to provide context, to personalize, and to support abstractions. Humans don't talk about bits and bytes and characters. They talk about high level concepts. That's what the system also needs to support. So, um, you know, the reason why the deep learning, for example, needs knowledge is that um, it brought, brings together, um, you know, the kind of computation that is necessary. Uh, there are other disciplines such as behavioral economics, cognitive science, 
that have uh, observed that um, you know there are different kinds of uh, computations or or thought processes or thinking that goes on in the human brain and and that is what constitutes intelligence and uh, that intelligence is what leads us to ultimately the wisdom well uh, we need the knowledge and experience to be able to succeed now in a um, you know a talk um, uh, recently uh, reflecting on what is happening in deep learning there is a um, growing amount of um, uh, realization that uh, both data and knowledge has to be used and you can see for example so there was a beautiful article um, uh, that um, uh, 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 Rao had about uh, the need for um, uh, explicit knowledge the tacit knowledge as you see in deep learning is not sufficient in a recent paper we talked about you know uh, being able to uh, uh, use uh, uh, combine the you know kind of uh, symbol uh, the statistical processing with symbolic reasoning for uh, the ability to make better decisions and take actions. So um, um, uh, I'll give you a couple of uh, a, a quick example of how knowledge is a game changer. This is an example where on the left hand side you see tweets, and on the right hand side you see um, sensor data in the bottom. But how do you combine the two? How do you connect sensor data with, um, uh, uh, with, with uh, textual data? Well, you really have to use the knowledge to make uh, the connection between the two. You really need to uh, go at high level of abstraction and representation before you can connect the two. Um, the, you know, uh, there are many statistical techniques um, uh, where you can do clustering, let's say. But those clusterings don't give you enough insight. You need to be able to label those concepts. How do you label that? Well, this is where the knowledge will come into picture. It will allow you to organize what you find in terms of patterns in the data to something that you can talk about, something you can act upon. Now, um, there are many ways that knowledge can be combined with data. So uh, the, in the, uh, you know, a series of um, uh, algorithms and, and techniques we call knowledge infused learning, you can uh, convert uh, knowledge into a form that is compatible with the data and then combine the two to um, kind of uh, change the weights uh, uh, in the data, in the vector uh, created from data to come up with a better result. That is shallow infusion. In another case, we would want to use the knowledge to uh, change the affect the parameters or the tension um, and in that particular case with the change in parameters you need to better uh, decision making or process and in another case uh, we call deep infusion there is a multi-tier uh, representation of certified representation of knowledge as well as there is um, you know of course layered computation that goes on in ai uh, you know, deep learning algorithm. And we try to find connections between the two, lower level representation and, and, and uh, knowledge at that level, for example, about uh, finding contours, um, finding, um, you know, uh, colors and, uh, and, and texture, finding shapes, finding objects. There are different layers of, you know, connect computations and corresponding knowledge that can be infused in the system to, um, uh, make the system, uh, you know, smarter and, 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 and more powerful. Being able to explain is very important. Many times uh, these days, in many cases these days, clinicians, for example, would not uh, accept a deep learning algorithm. <coughs> because if the doctor cannot explain why there is a particular prediction, then they would not be able to make a decision based on that kind of processing. <coughs> Excuse me. You need to be able to explain and record why you're making certain choice. <coughs> Doing, getting that explanation without having knowledge is extremely hard if not impossible. So to open up this black box, in these techniques that infuse knowledge, 
we are able to <clears throat> open up the black box and create explanations that will allow you to make better decisions. <clears throat> so infusion of domain knowledge improves a whole variety of things that uh, we talked about. Fundamentally, it enables experimentality and there are a lot of things, there are all these terms you can see on the right hand side. They are heavily related to us being able to explain what is happening. And what happens is that while uh, statistical techniques are very powerful in finding patterns from the data, providing the label to those patterns, providing the uh, providing a way to refer to what that computation is about, what that finding is about. <clears throat> that is made possible by the use of knowledge. Bias is a big problem. Again, knowledge can um, really help you a lot in handling the bias in a more uh, straightforward way. <clears throat> so what I have discussed basically is that what you find today from machine learning and deep learning is quite inadequate. That there are a lot more factors to consider before you say that the computational system, the AI system gives you enough help to the user and the applications. Some of the core things are to contextualize, to personalize, to support abstractions and explainability. All these are the powerful requirements, important requirements that is possible to support by use of data and knowledge. For example, representation of context pretty much requires use of knowledge or at least use of knowledge makes it much easier and concrete and um, uh, easy to describe uh, what that data is about or the context of the data. Techniques like knowledge infused learning are very important and they give you explained data. When this is done, you can get deeper insight, understanding, you can make better uh, uh, decisions, good decisions and take timely actions. That is what the wisdom is about. So the series of, uh, 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 you know, talks that we are going to talk, uh, a series of uh, use cases, computational, framework that we are going to describe um, is going to be about um, uh, showing you um, how that is done. So I'll pass on now to Kaushik. Okay, can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay. So I'll talk about how you can use uh, knowledge to transform the data. Uh, so, so that it enables uh, wisdom in the decision making task based on the uh, wisdom in the outcome based on the task. So um, neural networks, uh, what they typically use deep networks is that uh, as input, they take the text and convert it into vectors. The, this is called as embeddings. Uh, model that uh, can be used to do this is word to vec. So the idea is that um, between the sentences in the corpus, the words that have similar surrounding context, they end up uh, close to each other in the embedding space. And here you can see a two-dimensional um, example of, uh, of a vector that represents one of these words. So then for uh, this kind of input, there are explanation models. So let's say you use that input to predict some outcome. For example, in this case, um, what kind of uh, physics is the outcome talking about? And so um, first of all, the outcome uh, may not actually capture that. It may just say that the sentences talk about physics. And then the explanation module highlights some part of the embedding vector that says that this particular uh, dimension contributed more towards the prediction. So from this alone, we can uh, um, qualitatively understand what is going on in the deep learning pipeline. So 
um, are, are they talking about uh, nuclear physics uh, or um, why did the outcome end up in nuclear physics? What feature exactly does the number 0.15 map to? These are the places where knowledge can help us. So I'll show a few examples of that. Um, before that, um, what neural networks can do today is uh, um, be able to show some form of interpretability through uh, what they call attention models. And in attention models, um, which words are important towards the outcome is highlighted once you visualize it. And But the problem with this is that uh, every time you run the model, different words are highlighted. So it's not a um, uh, convex optimization process. So every time you reach a different optimum and therefore different uh, words are highlighted. But most of these things are generally uh, deterministic in nature uh, or mostly factual in nature. Why is somebody uh, going to obtain some stimulus? It's uh, in real life, it's always due to something like they may lose their jobs or pay, uh, need to pay rent or meet basic expenditures. That explanation doesn't change every time you run the model. So knowledge helps ground the explanation in factual uh, knowledge. Um, so deep learning methods that have before tried to exploit um, graphical knowledge in the form of knowledge graphs are uh, graph neural networks. So with that, what you can get is entities that are contextually relevant to each other based on the knowledge. For example, uh, worthless and feeling hopeless in a mental health context are closer together than uh, in a non-mental health context. So if you use a graph neural network to encode this knowledge in the embedding space, it does end up uh, putting together words that are contextually relevant to each other. But what it can't handle is that um, what exactly is the relationship between feeling worthless and feeling hopeless that is lost. The uh, relationships aren't modeled by the graph neural network. And also relationships uh, are sometimes as asymmetric. So the space in which this is modeled is a symmetric space, a Euclidean space. So it doesn't exactly capture the semantics um, because um, it does not model relationships. And also at a fundamental level, the mathematics don't uh, allow for the exact semantics to be modeled because of the symmetric nature of the space. So here uh, is an example from a mental health domain on, uh, let's say the task for a doctor is that they need to understand that this person has uh, depression or not. So uh, there is the data and that's raw data. Now, um, the context surrounding depression, the doctor examines and finds out that uh, manic episodes that this person has isn't characteristic to depression. So this is akin to a bot realizing this information if it had a knowledge graph built into it. So for example, a knowledge graph such as Nomad City. So you can um, use uh, a knowledge graph to uh, encode human-like behavior in understanding the data, in contextualizing the data uh, in an in a, uh, AI system. So this is, um, for example, at an operational level, how it would work. It would anchor the search around the term depression and find out that through the SNOMED city that manic episodes are a trait of anxiety. And so uh, the knowledge says that this person does not have depression. So the doctor is predicting whether or not they have depression. And... Sorry. Okay. Um, so the wisdom that is enabled by the knowledge here is that um, um, you, the doctor has a clear explanation as to why this person has been tagged as not depressed and something else. So knowledge, a contextualization can enable wisdom in the downstream prediction tasks with, with explanation. And this is um, exactly how it happens. 
So the words that um, are uh, of interest to the doctor are mapped uh, through multi-hop traversal of medical knowledge graphs. This is exactly how the contextualization happened. Now, uh, a little more detail into how uh, different types of knowledge can help us. We'll start with domain knowledge. So um, domain specific knowledge, meaning uh, knowledge specific to mental health, like the DSM-5 or SNOMED city. So uh, not long ago, OpenAI's GPT-3, which is the which was then the largest transformer model. It has 175 billion parameters. Even today, there aren't much bigger models. Um, was deployed in a mental health domain. And the patient during a conversation with GPT-3 um, asked GPT-3 if they should kill themselves. And GPT-3 responded affirmatively. So um, this is a big red flag. And somebody who is observing the system has absolutely no way of knowing why GPT-3 responded this way. Because the previous response, if you look at it, I feel bad and I want to kill myself, GPT-3 responded reasonably. So sometimes it's doing the right thing, sometimes it's not. This is the issue. The black box nature of these neural network models don't allow for further scrutiny. And furthermore, GPT-3 it's clear from this example that it doesn't actually have any knowledge of what um, it means to be suicidal. Otherwise, it would not. It would immediately have identified from the context that this person is suicidal, and uh, taken a more um, uh, wise action. So, how can we achieve that through knowledge? So, if we look at the categorization of suicide by hanging. Let's say Adam uh, went to a chatbot and uh, uh, um, the chatbot got this information that Adam has attempted suicide by hanging. And now the chatbot wants to figure out what are the potential causes and reasons for this person's suicide by hanging attempt and how should it respond. So from the knowledge here um, in SNOMED, it can see that suicide by hanging is a case of suicide, uh, attempted suicide. and Possible related context is drug overdose or personal history of self-harm or severe depressive psychotic symptoms. So uh, a, a, a explanation thread can be constructed like that. So in general, the rule would be that the abstract concept that it's related to is the parent in the graph and the uh, related contexts are its siblings and uh, so you see here that it can write down that the bot can then uh, uh, properly understand the statement as Adam has attempted suicide, showing personal history of self-harm, could be overdosing or have a personal history of uh, self-harm again, having other uh, severe depressive uh, episode uh, symptoms. So now with all of this additional information, it can definitely understand that uh, this person is uh, positively suicidal. So that, that is the wisdom that the contextualization through knowledge enables. Um, the action that it takes once it understands that this person is positively suicidal is to direct them to an emergency hotline or an expert with the explanation that it constructed. And not only can it enable uh, wisdom such as explainability, it can also enable uh, safe action. It did. So explainability isn't the only uh, facet to the uh, wise decision making. There's also the fact that it, it, it uh, took the best course of action that uh, in, in terms of user safety. And furthermore, uh, during conversation with Adam, it could have gathered that uh, the bot could have gathered that uh, Adam suffers from uh, alcoholism, alcohol di disorder, right? And so in a normal conversation, uh, say a bot like GPT-3 or even a mental health chatbot the, that has been trained on uh, pop at a population level, if Adam had this conversation on the left with uh, the bot, it's likely that the bot would uh, um, not discourage a drink every once in a while. But if uh, there was a degree of personalization, the bot would discourage it. So knowledge can enable explainability, 
it can enable um, user safety in the uh, decision making and it can enable personalization so um, some more domain examples of this in information seeking for example um, so if we look at um, the state of the art model for information seeking today it's a google t5 um, and if uh, we provide the model with this context um, this is about a girl who is um, who is uh, depressed for family reasons and uh, she does not understand why she has no financial issues uh, or she has a loving family but she doesn't understand why she is depressed so the answer is uh, i am depressed and the task is to seek information as to why this person is depressed so when we ran this through google t5 the questions that it generated is um, what you see on the screen so these aren't very meaningful right because um, it seems that google t5 doesn't uh, accurately understand uh, the information that's present in this passage so as soon as we used wikidata to highlight parts of the text that um, are contributing to this person's depression like addicted uh, friends or family and that they discussed people or drop out of school they have urges once you identify uh, this information through uh, wikidata and uh, also identify that generally this person has self destructive tendencies so this summary tells uh, tells us that the summary is generated using google t5 once you concatenate the wikidata annotated text and the summary you get much better questions so why do you want to be addicted why do you want to discuss people or do you want to drop out of school or speak to a counselor or therapist the the way that this uh, process of tagging takes place is first the named entity recognition happens in the paragraph and then the relationship extraction this happens through spacey and then entity linking uh, with any knowledge graph that uh, we can use so wikidata in this case okay so the next example is recommendation systems um, so if you've used some platform like spotify um, and you're listening to a song shape of you and then spotify recommends a castle on the hill and i see fire now um, it's a essentially a correlational uh, based recommendation so it's collaborative behavior every lot of people who listen to shape of you also listen to these other two songs and that's why it's recommending that but uh, that's not uh, typically uh, why this person may listen to that there could be other reasons that can be one of the reasons but other reasons can be that they're listening to this uh, these other songs because they're from a common artist or they closely follow some artist so in this case it happens to be that the uh, the true reason for uh, uh, the, this person being interested in the recommendations is because they are from the same artist so if you if we bring in a knowledge graph then we see that um these songs are sung by ed sheeran and not only that they are also of the pop genre so and they are also in the same album divide so now this explanation makes much more sense as to why this recommendation was provided um so, uh, so knowledge can enable this sort of explanation by tracing through the uh, knowledge graph this is a possible deep learning architecture that can exploit the knowledge graph structure to predict it's a lstm model uh, so for example you could have embeddings for each of a triple and uh, each sequence of triples that is traversed um, in the knowledge graph to predict if you have knowledge graph information so in that case you can visualize the embeddings the embeddings that are highlighted and you can uh, figure out the explanation so this is a way to use deep learning with knowledge graphs to uh, to find an explanation for the recommendation so a similar um, thing that can be done is to um, in a movie recommendation domain so 
the item that was recommended to them was Russia or Titanic and Fantasia. Uh, th these are the items that they consumed, I mean, and the recommended movie was Shakespeare in Love. So here is a concrete example of uh, what the explanation is going to be when you use a LSTM model, like the one I showed in the previous slide with the knowledge. It highlights the parts, the embeddings that, uh, that are active in, in the LSTM model. Okay, so now all this time I've been talking about domain specific knowledge in uh, contextualizing the data, but there can be multiple types of knowledge in uh, contextualizing the data. It could uh, be, for example, a language or syntactic knowledge, which is parse trees. It could be linguistic knowledge, which has information about which words are similar to each other, like WordNet. It could be common sense knowledge, um, like, um, apples and oranges can be used to make juice in conceptnet it can be broad based knowledge like wikidata which has a big uh, database of knowledge about many things or it can be domain specific knowledge which we have already seen examples of uh, so far dsm5 and uh, snowmed and that kind of thing so if a if a bot is uh, deployed that can that has access to all these kinds of knowledge then depending on the application, it will need to integrate these uh, one or more uh, of these into, uh, into a knowledge graph and consolidate it into its knowledge database. So uh, I'll show some examples of that. For example, here, um, the task of the chatbot is to respond to the user by understanding their um, COVID-19 related mental health. So, uh, WordNet can be used to understand that alone and lonely are the same uh, sense in, in meaning. And um, suicidal can be uh, mapped to um, the DSM-5 concept, right? Lexicons, so lexicons are flattened knowledge graphs. Um, you go through paths in the knowledge graph and you remove the relationships and then you, uh, you end up with a phrase. So lexicons are created from the knowledge graph. And these uh, terms can be identified by uh, cosine similarity matches to the lexicons. But here we see an example where um, uh, two of the hierarchy that it's not a hierarchy, two of the types of knowledge that I showed in the previous slide is used here, which is domain specific knowledge and WordNet. In this case, uh, the task is to understand if uh, this user is absent minded. And for this kind of task, ConceptNet alone is enough to uh, understand synonyms and related terms uh, to identify accurately if the person is absent-minded or not. Um, now, this is a slightly more complicated example. So there's uh, a sentence one and two, which talks about how benzodiazepine withdrawal happens by increasing a stimulating chemicals in the brain. And sentence two says pretty much the same thing, but paraphrased. And it names a stimulating chemical, serotonin. So how do we figure out that these two sentences are talking about the same thing? And are they talking about withdrawal? So um, WordNet can be used to identify that increasing stimulating chemicals and heightened st stimulating chemical production has the same sense uh, linguistically. Uh, in, in ConceptNet, uh, if you type in serotonin in, in ConceptNet's website, it shows it as a neurotransmitter or stimulating chemical. So we have identified these two pieces of information and connected them to a concept in a knowledge graph. The last thing is when you string together benzodiazepine, uh, increased neurotransmitters such as serotonin in, uh, and uh, uh, query that with the DSM-5 we immediately end up with a chapter on withdrawal. So now based on this form of um, contextualization, the bot or the doctor uh, is better positioned to um, prescribe medicine that deals specifically with withdrawal. This could be a whole bunch of other illnesses if this kind of context was not narrowed down. So here it, it helps the bot a lot in identifying exactly what kind of um, action to take. So that's the wisdom that knowledge enables. 
by contextualization. So here we are using three types of knowledge. As, a, as another example here, uh, we have to identify if uh, these uh, sentences are hate speech or not. So sometimes um, it's ideological, sometimes it's religious, um, sometimes it is actually hate. So uh, it's to identify that we need to construct a custom knowledge graph sometimes, which is maybe not existing yet, where we can see that the words related to the first example are ideological and the uh, phrases related in the second example exhibit religious and ideological uh, behavior. And in the third example, they uh, exhibit hate speech. So for the reason this is useful is that uh, say a bot is trying to filter out hate speech from a bunch of tweets. Um, a neural network model, when we tried specifically these three examples, filtered out all of them as hate speech simply because of the word jihad in it. So knowledge can enable better wisdom in clearing out uh, the actual hate speech examples by identifying that example one and two are not actually hate speech. Okay, as a, as a final example uh, of using, so it does not need to be different kind of knowledge every time we can use uh, domain specific knowledge twice or broad based knowledge uh, together with domain specific knowledge. So DB DBpedia is like Wikidata, it's uh, broad based knowledge. So here uh, we can use DBpedia to identify uh, categories related to uh, COVID and CDC. But CDC is a term that is not usually present in, uh, in language models. So you need another knowledge graph uh, to identify CDC itself. Again, DBpedia can do that. And then you need SNOMED city, which is a domain specific knowledge graph to identify uh, entities related to influenza like illness, influenza season, and uh, these other things highlighted in red. So now by parsing this text through uh, relevant sources of knowledge, we have uh, entities that are um, related to what we, uh, the downstream task. So the downstream task is perform a search query related to the paragraph to retrieve relevant paragraphs. So if we perform the search query with these final set of entities, instead of just the paragraph as a whole on top, we obtain much more relevant passages. So uh, all these examples show how knowledge can be used to uh, contextualize and abstract better. Uh, to enable different kinds of wisdom like explainability and um, user safety and uh, uh, personalized action. So the takeaway from all these slides is um, how can we use different types of knowledge depending on the type of application and the downstream task to uh, uh, add semantics to the data. So help contextualize and abstract the data. and. Um, how, what kind of wisdom does this enable and how in the uh, form of the three kinds of wisdom that we have seen so far in the decisions that uh, were taken by either the bot or a human being. So the opportunities lie in incorporating different kinds of knowledge in conceptualizing the data. There is some work on it. Um, and then uh, to show clearly how, depending on the task, the wiser decision was made and what is the explanation for it. And of course, there is uh, immense real world impact for this kind of uh, uh, AI system. Uh, you will have not just better decision making ability, but the decision will be explainable, it will be safe, it will be personal uh, to each individual. And these are all very important things in real world tasks. So now I'll pass it on to Usha. Are we taking break now, Kaushik? Okay, let's take a five minute break. And I'll take any questions if there are any right now.
Okay, so there is one question by Manus. Um, do you think random sampling of data hurts the robustness of AI alg algorithms and how can knowledge help? So uh, in general, random sampling of data is always at risk of not covering the whole space. Because uh, if you randomly sample, then there's every possibility that you don't hit some part of the example space. So then if that part of the example space is not present in your data, knowledge can be used to make more informed decisions on that part of the space that was not sampled. And moreover, on the part of the space that was sampled, if there has uh, if any noise crept in, the knowledge can also be used to smooth that out in the final prediction. Uh, I do have one more question. I do have one question, Kaushik, can yeah. you hear me? Yeah. Good. Okay. So, uh, uh, for example, like uh, I have seen an extensive literature where uh, people have tried to incorporate knowledge uh, independent of the data. For example, let's say uh, I have my image net or you can take a, let's, let me take it in a very broad domain uh, about zero shot learning, let's say. So in a zero shot learning, the concept is that you are leveraging external knowledge uh, in making the AI algorithm understand uh, how to interpret the data. But that knowledge, right, is, is, is fed into the model independently of the data. So the data is not transformed or data is not even touched upon uh, by that knowledge and they are acted as they are given as a separate component. And then there is some convolutional or pooling layer operations that happens uh, internally in the algorithm to mix and match the the knowledge and the data so uh, that is one way that i have experienced in which people have tried to incorporate knowledge uh, and to help the ai algorithm search the space uh, what benefit do you get when we try to transform or enrich the data beforehand before submitting uh, before sending it to an, a, a learning algorithm to act upon it so uh, my question is like, uh, uh, what is the difference between giving the data knowledge as an independent component, and then you do an aggregation and convolution operations uh, using an AI algorithm, or uh, or uh, the other way is you use the knowledge to improve upon the data first, and then you give the transformed data to the algorithm. Isn't in the first case uh, knowledge uh, just extra data? Come again, Dakshit. Isn't in the first case knowledge just some extra data? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, I, I, in, you know, um, cognitive, you know, speaking using, you know, uh, human cognition in mind, the whole, um, the, the idea of uh, taking data and knowledge and then applying uh, statistical learning is entirely different beast compared to taking the data and um, applying knowledge to it and raising the level of abstraction. Um, in that process, um, when done right, you are um, um, you know, taking low level data and representing that into something, let's say with label, something, let's say you uh, name the cluster, let's see, let's say that you actually have embedded relationships between entities. 
so you have um, really made a ritual representation uh, and uh, possibly a representation where you can apply additional filter which may be meaningful uh, semantic filtering you can do you can apply um, so it's, it's uh, they are not um, good complement of each other um, uh, just treating knowledge as additional data is quick and dirty way of throwing something more at it and uh, it will it might it will help marginally but it will never replace the um, you know uh, abstracting out data to high level of representation one with the richer modeling construct as, as entities as relationships as uh, taxonomy or whatever you uh, achieve depending upon your your knowledge representation choices Absolutely, and because the, because that's a kind of a reason that I the, re, the 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 reason I came up with this question was I kind of see a marginal improvement when you use zero short learning or few short learning or k short learning because you know you don't know how much k is it or what type of k are you how many k's how many samples are you including it in your model because most of like few short learning or zero short learning are completely driven by that you send your data and your knowledge independently into the model without actually doing transformation on the data. So uh, the you assume that convolution would do the job of doing it or attention would do the job of finding what is relevant, uh, which is still far from the reach, uh, far from the idea of explanations. Yeah, but and find what is relevant also from the data is very different than what is relevant based on uh, human described uh, knowledge representation. Typically, knowledge graph is human readable. Uh, typically, um, and machine readable. Ontology is human readable and machine readable. So, um, you know, uh, that is can't be replaced by, uh, you know, the flatness of the data. Right, right. Andres has raised his hand. Andres, do you have a question? Yeah, uh, also for you, Kaushik, uh, and, uh, and maybe uh, to also for Manas, um, when you were talking about um, training our algorithm to to identify uh, suicidal comments or suicidal statements, I had, a, mm, yeah, maybe we use uh, some cases in that the language refers specifically to the intention to commit suicide or make self harm, no? But I don't know if we can make the algorithm uh, predict, predict, uh, you know, predictive because, you know, people usually use another kind of language that is not so explicit when they are talking about doing certain kind of things. And there can be something like a tricky word or tricky statement that refer exactly to the same. So I don't know if, if there are some research that are aiming to teach the algorithm to be more and more, to go more and more deeply, to, to catch this kind of meta meanings in the contextualization and um, behind a certain word that are pretty explicit. Right, so that is the idea of uh, knowledge-infused learning where you can use the knowledge in the deep learning pipeline or machine learning pipeline to uh, identify the context behind uh, uh, the words contained in the paragraph at a deeper level. So uh, uh, you're right, you said that sometimes maybe it is not that clear, the, mm -hmm. the context, but in that case, um, other things can be done. Like you can identify the context to a certain extent from the knowledge graph the rest of it can be summarized. Like I showed in the slides, uh, the noise can be removed by for tagging plus summarizing. So there are a few bunch of practical things that can be done to um, uh, filter out the noise when there's a lot written and uh, it's not very clear what is in that paragraph. Mm -hmm. But in general, uh, once uh, this pre-processing is done where let's say it's summarization, for example, and then you uh, use the knowledge. Um, it can identify, uh, at least from the uh, data that we have seen, this is usually data from Reddit, uh, uh, mental health subreddit. 
um, it, the knowledge mm -hmm. can uh, quite accurately identify the disorder that this person is uh, suffering from. Okay. Interesting. Thank you. And no problem. Usha, let's go. Yeah. From this point in the talk, we will talk about the literature on using knowledge graphs to enable better outcomes in several scenarios. This uh, slide talks about a method called knowledge infused word. Uh, so the intuition with, uh, behind this uh, method is contextual entity representations learned by the deep learning model, uh, like BERT or GPT, they just leverage the attention mechanism to learn the data. But these models are uh, still do not understand how to leverage the knowledge, knowledge context present in the knowledge graph. Uh, so uh, it knowledge graph in the sense, uh, the context can be understood as its semantics about entities and the neighboring entities. So uh, this knowledge infused word uh, is proven as a novel and novel and effective technique uh, to infuse knowledge context from knowledge graphs uh, from concept net and word net in this case. And this method uh, significantly outperforms word. So let us look at the two sentences over here, which were given as input. Uh, the, how does greenhouse effect cause rise in temperature by trapping solar energy? And sentence two is how does absorption of solar radiation exhibited by greenhouse effect produce heat? Uh, so uh, conceptual entities extracted from this input record are greenhouse effect, solar radiation, and uh, solar energy. Uh, whereas ambiguous ent entities are trapping, absorption are extracted from here. So knowledge embeddings of these en entities uh, uh, are important to understand to project them to the vector space of a language model. So in that sense, uh, our knowledge graph is uh, infused in the language model like BERT. Okay. So this uh, talks about a knowledge-aware assessment of severity of suicide risk for early intervention. Here, the knowledge uh, comes from the lexicons that are built from these medical knowledge sources like SNOMED, ICD-10, UMLS, and clinical trials data. And uh, uh, the wisdom comes in the form of how mental health professionals will be informed about the patient's conditions, including the suicide, suicidality of uh, risk of each patient to enable a timely intervention. So they use lexicons uh, and flatten the relational structure. And it is very important to understand not only the entities uh, we identify in the data, but also the relationships between them and how severe the suicide risk over here is. So um, uh, in this study, uh, we make use of Reddit as a data source to study the suicidal tendencies. And uh, we curate this data carefully to predict the severity of suicide risk for each individual. And for this, we make use of a suicide uh, risk severity lexicon that we uh, developed using the medical sources that I mentioned. And uh, we also use a DSM-5 lexicon, uh, which is a uh, mental health uh, manual of mental disorders uh, uh, lexicon uh, for a robust classification of mental health disorders. And uh, from this, we understand the mental health of uh, each patient and also the suicide uh, risk of each individual to better enable the mental health professionals to take the decision. Okay. So these uh, posts that we are seeing on the screen are coming from the subreddit, bipolar uh, subreddit. And the subreddit uh, information are uh, mapped to the DSM-5 uh, disorder over here. So you can see the depression disorder. 
uh, and the addiction related uh, substance use related uh, terms are mapped to the substance use and uh, addictive disorder using a drug abuse ontology and uh, in the next slides we will go uh, through what is uh, drug abuse ontology okay so here is a drug abuse ontology which has a certain number of classes and properties and uh, how do we make use of drug abuse ontology uh, in this text we are able to identify dosage and intervals and route of administration and the relationships so it is very important to understand the relationships apart from the entities uh, like it proved effective in adding knowledge to our deep learning models and uh, so from this uh, screen uh, slide we can understand that uh, uh, some of the applications of drug abuse ontology in determining the uh, knowledge like dosage interval and relationships and uh, we will further uh, uh, move on to the behaviors related to the uh, medical use of certain terms over here and other illicit opioids to analysis of uh, web forum data so this uh, example comes from a web forum called blue light um, Here the task is to extract the knowledge to enable wisdom in the form of informed public health decisions. So the wisdom comes from the insights uh, that we uh, drew from the drug abuse ontology when analyzing social media data and dark web data. And uh, it proved effective in adding uh, knowledge and determining user knowledge, attitudes and behavior. Uh, suppose uh, uh, consider a entity buprenorphine. Uh, we are able to understand the non-medical use of buprenorphine, uh, uh, like the terms bup and bup, uh, the slang terms of buprenorphine uh, in social media data. And uh, we are able to understand patterns and trends of cannabis product use uh, through drug abuse ontology. If you see here, cannabis uh, is a super class is drug and the slang terms are weed and marijuana. Side effects over here are depression, pain, so all these uh, all the all this understanding of cannabis in the social media data is not possible without uh, drug abuse ontology because there are uh, several users who post uh, like weed or uh, cause pain or uh, uh, marijuana or uh, ganja they use uh, some slang terms to cannabis and uh, we are able to capture all the entities of cannabis and the relationships uh, to it in drug abuse ontology with the help of uh, uh, these uh, relationships. So right side, uh, you can see how uh, the old file of the ontology looks like. So this is the regular ontology old file. So here uh, we talk about how we extracted uh, wisdom from Ragavi's ontology as a decision making. So uh, for this, a web form called Blue Light was queried to extract post with a mention of lopramide and uh, relevant brand, brand name and slang term related to lopramide. So uh, some posts, uh, uh, some member of posts were identified using the drug abuse ontology using the slang terms related to lopramide. Uh, as you can see here, so lopramide, lopramide is a subclass of pure agonist and it has several slang terms that we extracted from drug abuse ontology. And we, we are aware of what are the parent classes and uh, of lopramide over here. And so, uh, so a corpus was queried to extract this post mentioning lopramide and we did uh, some entity spotting using the drug abuse ontology. And we are able to uh, discover, discover lopramide is widely used for uh, a similar purpose where Buprenorphine and methadone are used as uh, used for the treatment of withdrawal. Similarly, lopramide is also used. Uh, it's called a poor man's medication, and it's used in 10, 10 times to 20 times more uh, than the prescribed thing. So, three toxicology studies following this uh, work uh, led to FDA warning. So, here the wisdom from the Peckinfield ontology comes as emerging alert uh, to FDA as a warning. This is one more use case how uh, we use drug, uh, drug abuse ontology in cannabis study on social media. 
so the key innovation of uh, our approach is uh, the adaptation of these uh, state of art algorithms to meet uh, drug abuse uh, unique needs of drug abuse research and how we uh, use ontology in this pipeline is uh, what we're going to discuss on this slide so um, here, uh, when we collect the data from web forums and feeds, uh, we use drug abuse ontology uh, to include uh, uh, in this pipeline to extract uh, more terms related to cannabis study and uh, what are the synthetic cannabinoid products that we have found from the study and uh, several mental health uh, related conditions associated with cannabis. So uh, in this uh, project, uh, we analyze characteristics of marijuana concentrate users and describe the patterns and the reasons for use. And uh, we are able to identify factors uh, uh, associated with the use of this concentrate on a Twitter, Twitter based survey. And uh, we are able to uh, study the attitudes and behaviors related to cannabis across US regions where uh, cannabis is legalized or not. So, um, so uh, these are the several works that are outcomes, and uh, we call it uh, we uh, call it as wisdom as insights over here. The first two studies analyze the association between cannabis and depression uh, using deep learning techniques, and uh, the ontology played a heavy role uh, in the first two works as uh, we are able to detect relationships like whether cannabis treated depression or false depression or if somebody is uh, uh, addicted to cannabis and that is why it is called depression. And uh, uh, the time for DAB's work over here explored the Twitter data on butane hash oil. And the goal is to examine differences in the volume of hash oil related tweets among the states with uh, different cannabis legalization policies. And, uh, the primary aim is to explore the social media data on uh, marijuana concentrate use in the US. So uh, the other work when bad is good, identifying personal communication sentiment in drug related tweets is to uh, automatically classify tweets and identify sentiment with the source of communication. If the source of communication is coming from the personal uh, user, um, individual user like us or a patient or a retail purpose expressed in a uh, cannabis synthetic uh, or cannabinoid related tweets. And the other uh, work, what's your type? Uh, this is very interesting because we are able to develop a, a multimodal approach in classifying users by their types, uh, uh, such as uh, user or retailer or a business purpose. And uh, this proved very effective in capturing the uh, trending topics and business profiling of marijuana companies and state specific marijuana policy making. So uh, the, all these systems come from the uh, use of uh, drug abuse ontology in the pipeline. Okay. So in this slide, uh, we are going to talk about how we developed a end-to-end -end knowledge in fields deep learning uh, framework that leverages a language model uh, with uh, domain specific ontology in this uh, case it is drug abuse ontology to jointly extract entities and their relationships so as you can see in this example we studied four relationships reason effect addiction and ambiguous so uh, when cannabis uh, treats depression it is a uh, reason when cannabis causes depression it is effect if somebody is addicted to depression, like the example you have to, you see here, the lack of weed in my life is depression as hell. So this is labeled as uh, addiction. So uh, ambiguous implies uh, some other types of relationships or too ambiguous to interpret. So in this work, we uh, prepared data uh, from social media by entity masking, like all the depression related terms that we have found from ontology is converted to the word depression. And all the cannabis related terms uh, in the social media text are converted to cannabis, like cannabis uh, can be used in many ways like weed, uh, marijuana. So all those terms are converted, all the slang terms are converted to the entity uh, cannabis. And it proved very effective uh, in the pipeline in the end results of our uh, deep learning model. And uh, so in this, uh, we, in this work, we introduced a state of art knowledge aware attention framework that leveraged knowledge from drug abuse ontology 
uh, DSM-5 in association with the language model BERT for cannabis depression relation extraction task. So, okay. So uh, this wisdom as capturing relationships on opioid uh, is uh, extracted from opioid drug knowledge graph. And we extract entities and the relationships using uh, both Ragepi's ontology and ODKG here. And we are, we are able to identify relationships with, between opioid and mental health disorders and suicide. So here, uh, so uh, wisdom comes as capturing relationships on opioid in these examples. And uh, we are also able to detect mental health disorders and suicidal risks risk in these examples. So this uh, is a different pipeline that we have where we study crypto markets. Um, and uh, we have uh, crypto markets like Empire, Dream, and Tochka, where we have, uh, it, looks, it looks like a uh, Amazon uh, website, but it is, uh, uh, it is dark web and uh, it, they sell illicit uh, opioids and uh, synthetic opioids and other products. So we analyzed crypto market uh, 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 opioids and fentanyl, fentanyl analogs and novel synthetic opio opio opioids uh, on crypto markets. So as you can see, there is a seller level screen and item level screen, and we are able to extract different items uh, of interest from these uh, uh, levels, which will go up in the next slide. So we use uh, drug cases ontology in the pipeline as knowledge and the wisdom we are extracting out of it is as emerging trend alert to end use, which is national drug early warning system. So uh, we, uh, the key aim is to uh, uh, extract uh, the products related to fentanyl and analogs and other synthetic opiates that as they come available on a uh, crypto market, we uh, make a report of them and uh, we uh, we give those, uh, provide those reports to end use and uh, they will make use of them to generate alerts uh, to the public health surveillance community. So this is the uh, product level screen that we uh, have seen in the previous slide. So uh, here the car fentanyl, as you can see car fentanyl 99.98% pure top quality 3 grams and Using uh, the title of the product title, we are able to identify uh, the parent entity of car fentanyl and uh, the purity of it and the usage of it. And uh, using the drug abuse ontology, uh, we have all these uh, entities already uh, classified in ontology that we are able to make use of it while extracting these uh, items. In the next uh, slide, we will see. Uh, uh, so th there are some vendor li listings that we have got, a similar vendor listing that we got from the Empire market over here. And we have uh, drug abuse ontology to extract uh, these uh, nitty gritty details like shipping information and uh, location of the product and uh, from where it is shipped and how many uh, grams is being uh, advised as route of administration uh, such information. And uh, we're also, oh, we are able to prepare the data from these crypto market using drug abuse ontology. Uh, and uh, that is an outcome of using, of including that in the pipeline. And we're able to identify a number of unique vendors, substances and locations and descriptions of uh, each product under different markets over here. So green market, Tochka, Wall Street and Empire market are uh, what we considered for this study. Okay, as mentioned in the previous slides, uh, reports about novel synthetic opioids being sold on crypto markets, uh, uh, like uh, what are the new fentanyl analogs or what are the novel synthetic opioids that uh, recently appeared on the crypto market are uh, given as support for the end use. So here the wisdom comes as actionable insight to the national data warning system. Uh, this study is pretty interesting because uh, we borrowed uh, knowledge from drug abuse ontology and the uh, crypto markets to uh, harness uh, social media trends of the same products that are uh, available on crypto markets. 
So we are able to identify these property names uh, from ontology. What is the product name? What is the substance? Like, uh, uh, what is the parent substance of the product name mentioned in that particular uh, item? And what is the uh, drug class it belongs to? What is the dosage advertised, quantity, and vendor price and shipping information? So uh, we are able to uh, do a emotion uh, uh, study on these studies compared to oxycodone, heroin, and kratom on seven kinds of emotions over here uh, from joy, sadness, anger, love, fear, thankful, and surprise. So we are also able to identify what are the topics of interest uh, related uh, to these drugs in each subreddit. We have considered here six subreddits. As you can see, the subreddit names and topics of interest in each subreddit. And uh, here the knowledge comes from drug abuse ontology and crypto markets and wisdom is uh, what is its relevance on social media and, and uh, how it is, uh, how the social media is uh, uh, making conversation about these new drugs that are found on crypto markets. So this is opiate drug national uh, knowledge graph and uh, this is a, a morphine uh, a, the morphine is the sub, sub graph extracted from the odkg over here and uh, it has around uh, 48 generic drug in ingredients and uh, 1960 classes and so this uh, opiate drug knowledge stuff is very useful in uh, extracting relationships uh, on opiate related conversations which is similar to drug abuse ontology so in the example over here, you can see uh, Duramorp 10 mg, morphine sulfate uh, 10 mg, solution, oxanol liquid, all include the active ingredient uh, morphine. So in this example, uh, in extracting the information, what this drug is part of and what are the trade names that it has, this particular drug has, and what is the form it is available in and what are the ingredients uh, in extracting these drug formulation, combinations and Trade names are uh, not possible without uh, uh, including ODKG. And these are just the first degree hops from the morphine in the ODKG. So if we further refine to the uh, second degree and third degree hops, we are able, to, we, we, are, we can identify more information uh, about this particular uh, example. Okay, this slide uh, talks about how do we capture opiate specific information using uh, ODKG uh, knowledge graph. And uh, data uh, driven information uh, may bring noise, which may cause information loss. But uh, when we capture the contents that contain the specific concept and how these concepts are related with each other is not uh, possible without uh, using the knowledge graph. Okay, looks like this uh, end slide is missing. You want to you want to change to other slide? Uh, maybe uh, Kaushik, you have it. Yeah, I will share it. Okay, Mushra. Uh, you can continue. Yes, yes, yes. No, I think all this is fine. You can. Uh, you did this. We need to go to conclusion. Towards conclusion now. Yeah. Okay. So these are some promising knowledge infused learning impacts in the area of robotics, cognitive science, and self driving cars and personal assistance. Uh, coming to robotics, uh, a knowledge-based reinforcement learning plays important role in effective decision making. So one of the examples is how knowledge rules are uh, uh, captured to drive the training model of a uh, self-driving car. 
and the cross domain knowledge uh, plays an important role and uh, one of the examples for this can be nuanced drag and drive reasoning engine and uh, coming to the cognitive science it is important uh, to understand how we can make personalized uh, suggestions to a user on uh, individual level and um, amazon alexa skills in understanding the current mood of the user and adapts its recommendations of movies or items which is an example of cognitive science and human intelligence and uh, empathy and mo morality plays an important role in the scenario of self driving cars because uh, making self driving cars more responsible in decision making by providing them with ethical rules uh, like uh, considering speed limit in residential neighborhood or uh, how to uh, be, uh, how to view a presence of a ball in the street even if it is not there in a way to slow down the speed of some ethical rules or moral rules that uh, uh, that we uh, make the self driving cars learn like uh, how to prevent itself from hitting gay pedestrians which need to be protected at all times or uh, similarly personal assistant uh, personalization plays a major role in developing a medical chatbots where uh, there are some complex health queries that are asked by uh, patients on individual level so to conclude this talk uh, today so uh, there have been extensive effort in improving the capabilities of ai by enhancing the feature engineering through data and external knowledge independently so in this tutorial we laid a foundation with well defined methods of knowledge infusion in data for assisting artificial intelligence in giving explainable outcomes in several scenarios we see knowledge infused learning methods as the approach interfacing distantly supervised and weekly supervised uh, learning with focus on data enrichment and uh, how we transform data through expert knowledge thank you yeah i think fundamentally if there's something that you want to take away from this is that um there are a lot of information processing um you know capabilities that we have developed uh but just like a natural language processing uh we have very powerful system like language translation but when you think about natural language understanding to actually have deeply to deeply understand what uh, uh, is, say, is said in the language or in a sensor data that is actionable by human uh, that will allow human to make decision and uh, you know uh, um, uh, and, and, and with, with the confidence that uh, uh, you, you that is necessary so in the wisdom when you say we have your good judgment. Um, then um, we are uh, there is a, a gap between uh, what purely data driven statistically AI can do and what um, uh, we need, uh, what applications need, what users need, what clinicians need, what decision maker needs. And uh, I think this is being increasingly recognized by uh, researchers, by technologists. And this is what is pushing in part to um, neurosymbolic computing or the third wave of AI. Uh, this is what is uh, where people are trying to integrate symbolic AI with statistical AI. And in our view, knowledge will play a critical role of gluing these two systems to connect statistical computation and in symbolic computation, the explicit representative knowledge will play a very critical role as will it play a role, uh, the knowledge will play a role also to go up from classification or, or ranking, you know, something to something that is necessary to make a decision, to uh, make a good judgment, uh, to have confidence, um, uh, you know, at, as humans need. Uh, and, and so uh, the whole thing is that data-driven, a purely data-driven system is not adequate. There's a lot to be gained. Throughout the example, uh, you know, examples we showed, even though we did not make a big deal about it, we kind of implied that there is always availability of uh, relevant knowledge. And by applying that knowledge, you will be able to bridge this gap and, and really uh, create um, a more intelligent system. So there are a few other things in the uh, tutorial presentation that we welcome you to see later on. Uh, there are resources and publications and data sets and uh, all those kind of stuff. Since there is a shorter, uh, you know, 90 minute tutorial, uh, we didn't have a hands-on component um, here, but I, it would be quite possible for 
uh, you to uh, do that on your own or uh, seek our um, uh, you know guidance if you are interested so with that uh, if there are there any questions um, we'll be happy to take them here otherwise um, we have used up the time Okay, looks like uh, I think we, we probably have, uh, you know, um, we don't need, um, uh, I guess there are no questions. So I think we'll, um, we thank you for attending the tutorial and hope it has been informative and um, we'll see you around online or elsewhere. Bye. Kaushik, you want to stop the recording?